We begin this morning by hearing from Dr. Mustafa Baghouti. It is a particular honour to be able to welcome him this morning. Dr. Baghouti is a Palestinian physician, activist and politician who serves as General Secretary of the Palestinian National Initiative and has been a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council since 2006. As you may have read in your programmes, Dr. Barghouti is, leader, uh, is a leader of the non-violent struggle for Palestine, for its self-determination and struggling against what he has described as the longest occupation in history. In recognition of his work, Dr. Barghouti was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010 and received the Légion d'honneur from France that same year. A cross-party early day motion in the House of Commons that same year spoke of his invaluable role in organising and encouraging Palestinian civil society in the fundamental principles of non-violence, acknowledging the tirelessness of his activities in the face of so many insurmountable obstacles that face all Palestinians living under Israeli occupation, whether that be in the West Bank or imprisoned in Gaza. Dr. Barghouti, it's wonderful uh, to have you here this morning. He will be speaking on Palestine, the results of the Balfour Declaration, colonialism, occupation, and apartheid. What future? Dr. Barghouti. Thank you so much, and good morning to all of you. And I want uh, to thank you all for this distinguished presence and participation. I would really like to thank the churches in Cheltenham for uh, arranging these events and this day. And I am really very pleased to be here with you. Uh, I think this meeting and your presence today is an additional proof that the Palestinian issue has not been marginalized, as some people wish to have. But before I speak specifically about Palestinian issue, I would like to refer to the fact that we live in a much more difficult world today than we did probably a few decades ago. I think what we witness is a serious regression of the values and principles of justice. And things, since things are quite connected with each other, I do think that the silence about Israeli crimes against the Palestinian people and the fact that Israel is allowed to be above the international law and totally unaccountable to international law is a reflection of a situation where we have many other injustices in this world, including, for instance, the fact that eight people own an amount of wealth that is equal to what three and a half billion people own in this world. Half the population of the world owns as much as eight people only. It's also a situation where many countries have a lot of wealth, yet they cannot provide $12 billion to make water, clean water available to everybody and thus eliminate so many diseases that humanity suffers from. It's a situation where sovereignty of states seems to have disappeared unless these states have nuclear power or try to develop nuclear power, as North Korea is trying to do. We've seen countries being violated, occupied, attacked, like Iran, like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, etc. And we've seen a regression of one very important principle, which I, at one point of my life, thought was very valuable and important to the Western world which are the values of democracy and judging governments by whether they are practicing democracy or not. 
this seems to have vanished, including actually the fact about how democracy is practiced in many Western countries. And if you want an example, you have a very good one in the election of Mr. Trump. I think all these things have shown and do show today that there is a struggle going on in our world, very similar to struggles that has happened, that have happened in many other times of, our, of humanity life. A struggle between values, principles, appreciation of what we call human rights and international humanitarian law, and those who want to establish a system of double standards where strategic interests are the main motivating factor and where the rule of jungle actually prevails. Those who are powerful can do what they want and those who do not have that power, especially military or economic power, will be suppressed. I never imagined that by the time we have the 50th anniversary of the Israeli military occupation of West Bank and Gaza, including Jerusalem, that this anniversary will just pass without really not much attention from today's world. Especially that it came also uh, close to another anniversary, which is 100 years since this Balfour Declaration was declared. And when we are one year away from another anniversary, which is the 70th anniversary of the displacement of more than 60% of the Palestinian population, who became the largest refugee population for a very long time, I think this situation of Palestine is a reflection of the situation in the world we live in. And let me say that I completely believe that the issue of Palestine is not a pure national issue. It's not a religious issue. But it is definitely an issue of absence of justice. It's an issue of whether we support justice or we do not, of whether Palestinians will be treated in a just manner or people will continue to be silent about their suffering or even complicit with the crimes that are committed against us. I was thinking while preparing this talk about the issue of Balfour Declaration and you know, it came to me that th this idea that this Balfour Declaration actually was very harmful, not only to Palestinians, but actually also to Jewish people. As a matter of fact, for pure colonial strategic interest of Britain, this declaration was made, and it has made those who have suffered from the Holocaust those who have suffered from anti-Semitism, those who have suffered from the pogroms in Russia, and those who have lived in great harmony with Palestinians in Palestine, they made them an enemy to the Palestinian people, but they made them also a participant in colonial plans against the whole Arab world. It transformed the Jewish people from being oppressed and from being in need for also justice to make them a participant in a system of oppression. And if you want a good example of that, you can just remember what happened in 1956 when Israel, France, and Britain attacked Egypt. And when Israel occupied Sinai and gave an excuse for Britain and France to attack Egypt, trying to deprive it from its independence. I think that declaration was totally unfair because when it was declared, actually 97% of the people in Palestine were Palestinians and only 3% were Jewish people. Not that one denies their right to live in equality, but in reality, 
that declaration it completely ignored the rights of the Palestinian people. If you look at what we've just heard, you look at the sentences of the declaration. It said it gave the Jewish people a homeland in a place where they had only 3% of the population, and it gave the other people, without even mentioning them as Palestinians, what they said, civil and religious rights, but not political rights, and not a homeland, and not national rights. While when it referred to Jewish people in other countries, it spoke about political rights. So you can see how profound this discrimination was and how unjust it has been. Since then, there has been three major effects and three major developments which I will describe to you in my presentation. The first thing was the act of ethnic cleansing in 1948 because what happened was nothing but an act of ethnic cleansing. When, through the creation of the State of Israel, 400 Palestinian villages and communities were completely destroyed, and their population were forced to leave. And it was done with a complicit approval, practically, of the British administration, who has just left Palestine. The second act was the occupation in 1967 of what remained of Palestine, and that is the West Bank and Gaza Strip. That occupation which has become the longest occupation in modern history. And finally, through a long process of destroying any possibility or potential for a compromise. Even when Palestinians reached a compromise, in Oslo Agreement, which I will describe to you later, and accepted a totally an unjust solution by have to have a state in less than half of what the United Nations decided they should have, even when we agreed with that very painful concession. Israel made sure during the last 24 years to destroy every potential and possibility of a two-state solution by the creation of settlement activities and the oppression of the Palestinian people. One outcome came out of this process, and that is what we have today, a system of apartheid, a system of racial discrimination. So this is an issue that is combining ethnic cleansing with military occupation and leading to a system of apartheid. If you look at these maps, this one shows you the partition plan, according to which the first one shows you the partition plan, according to which Israelis should have had 54% and Palestinians 44%. And... Uh, this never materialized because Israel was established on 78%, and what remained was only the West Bank and Gaza, which were occupied in 1967. When Palestinians signed Oslo Agreement back then, they practically agreed, agreed to have a state in West Bank and Gaza only, which is only 22%, as I described to you. But to the greatest surprise of Palestinian leaders when they went to negotiations in Camp David, this was the map that Barak offered them, the Prime Minister of Israel. A state without borders, a state without Jerusalem, and with the annexation of parts of the Palestinian territories. Later, Sharon came up with this map, which took away not only the Jordan Valley, not only the borders, but the whole Jordan Valley and the whole area around Jerusalem. Today's Israeli government makes very clear statements by ministers like Neftali Pinnit or Lieberman or even Netanyahu himself, the Prime Minister of Israel, declaring that their real plan is, is only this one. I mean, is, a, is a practically a map with no Palestinian territories whatsoever. 
And this whole process has happened through gradual annexation and gradual settlement building. This is the map of the West Bank, as you can see it. And these are the Palestinian communities, if this machine works. <laughs> yes. These are the so-called Area A, and these are the Area B er territories. You can see here that the Palestinian communities inside the occupied West Bank have been fragmented in 225 small islands, separated from each other by settlements, by military checkpoints, by a wall, and the whole black area here, which is called Area C, and that is no less than 62% of West Bank, is allocated completely to the needs of the growth of illegal settlements. How this process happened? This is the West Bank again. You can see here Area A and B. Then you can see settlements. You can see how they've spread them all over the West Bank. But the, the land size they control is much larger than the built-in area. And in addition to the 150 settlements, there are 120 settlement new outposts, each of which could easily become a new settlement. And then you have declared a closed military area, which means we, the Palestinians, are prohibited from entering. Then you have uh, military bases. Then you have the wall. The wall itself took big parts of the land, and I will show you that later. And then you have declared state land. Again, state land means a land prohibited for Palestinians but can be used by settlers. And then they have the created what we call the segregated roads. This is the first time in human history where major roads, main roads, are exclusive to Israeli people. If we are caught walking or driving on any of these roads, we could be sentenced to six months in jail. And these roads are not in Israel. They are in the occupied West Bank. I was myself arrested several times because I dared to go to Jerusalem. Although I was born in Jerusalem, and I worked as a medical doctor in the major hospital in Jerusalem called Maqasid Hospital for 15 years, but since 2005, they decided that I should not be allowed to enter Jerusalem. And since then, each time I have to go to Jerusalem, I have to break their laws and be subjected to the possibility of being arrested. The situation today, these segregated roads, which did not exist even during the worst time of apartheid in South Africa, and did not exist even during the worst time of segregation in the United States. Maybe they had segregated restaurants, segregated buses, but not segregated roads. Shows that practically what Israel has created in the West Bank and Gaza, and in Israel itself to a large extent, is nothing but a system of apartheid. The only difference between our map and this map of South Africa is that the Pantostans in South Africa were much larger. These figures show you what kind of system we have to tolerate. On average, a Palestinian is allowed to use no more than 50 cubic meters of water per year, while an Israeli legal settler is allowed to use 2,400 meters. 42 times more than Palestinians. And we are talking about water that comes from Palestinian water in the West Bank, not from Israel. On average, the GDP per capita, the gross domestic product per capita in Israel is around $38,000 today. And it is less than 2,000 for Palestinians. But we are obliged to buy products at Israeli market price. More than that, we are obliged to pay double the amount for water and electricity than what Israelis pay, although they make 22 times more than us. If we 
decide to send a patient for treatment in an Israeli hospital, we will be obliged to pay four times what Israelis would usually pay. So this is a serious system of segregation, a serious system of colonialism, and this is an example of the segregated roads. You can see on one side a highway, on the right side a highway for Israelis, and a very small and difficult road for Palestinians. You, this is the, the picture of workers going to work in Israel. They have to go through checkpoints. I recently met a worker in the north and I asked him, how does he work? He said, I wake up at two in the morning. I prepare myself and then leave to work. I arrive at the checkpoint at around three. I have to wait at the checkpoint for two, and two to three hours. Then after crossing the checkpoint and being checked and frequently humiliated, of course, I will have to take the bus to get to the job where an Israeli company is in charge. I work there till about uh, four o'clock. I come back, it takes me two hours or two to three hours to get home, and then I eat and go to sleep to wake up again and repeat the process. This is nothing but enslavement of the population. Additionally, this is an example of what, why the Israeli public, unfortunately, is moving so much to the side of, support, of, of, of voting for extremists and racist people in the Israeli government. These are the map, this is the map of the three cities uh, near Bethlehem. It's Bethlehem, Beit Sahur, and Beit Jala. In 1967, Israel annexed Jerusalem, but with, with it, it annexed the northern parts of Beit Sahur, Beit Jala, and Bethlehem. Thus, annexing no less than 17% of the land of Beit Sahur, around 8% uh, of Bethlehem, and 22% and of the land of Beit Jala. Later, they built the wall, claiming it was for security, taking away 10% again of Beit Sahur, 1% more of Bethlehem, and no less than 24% of the land of Beit Jala. So, by now, Bejala has lost already 46% of its land. Then they built new settlements. And it is quite possible that very soon they will say, we need to expand the wall again and take more land. The cost of the land that was confiscated in Bethlehem area alone, which is, by the way, a small district in the West Bank, the cost of that land is no less than $30 billion, which was used, of course, for Israeli economy and from which the Israeli public has benefited. The story of Gaza is another very sad story. Gaza is not free, as the Israelis claim. Gaza is still under Israeli occupation, only a different form of occupation. Since 2006, Israel has conducted three major attacks on the population of Gaza. I was there during all these attacks, and I've witnessed myself while trying to organize and provide health care through Palestinian Medical Relief Society. I witnessed how the Israelis conducted massacres. The last attack took place in 2014, during which the Israeli army killed 2,250 Palestinians, including 590 children, and 450,000 people, almost 30% of the population of Gaza, became homeless. All their homes were completely destroyed. This is an example of what happened. This is the neighborhood of Shija'iyah in Gaza. This was taken this photo was taken one week before the attack. 
And this is how the neighborhood looked after, one week after the attack. You can imagine, imagine the amount of destruction and suffering that was caused. Gaza Strip is still under occupation. Two million people live there in an area that is no more than 140 squared miles. But that little area has been deducted further. During the last 15 years, Israeli army decided to create what they call buffer zone, through which they took away, in the beginning, 8% uh, of Gaza, then 17%, and now about 25% of Gaza Strip is prohibited for the people in Gaza. So practically the area became much smaller. Of course, you know that the airspace is controlled by Israel, as well as the sea, where fishermen are not allowed to go deeper than six miles into the sea if they want to fish. These are examples of how many settlements have been created around Jerusalem to separate it from the rest of the West Bank, of course. And this is an example of what happened during the years of all prime ministers, whether it was Shimon Peres, Yehud Barak, Netanyahu, Sharon, or Olmert, or Netanyahu again. The growth of settlements and settlement activities continued. But today, after President Trump was elected, the rate at which settlements expand has increased by no less than 80%. And, of course, the settlements are killing the very possibility of what we call two-state solution. This is the wall for those who have not been in Palestine. It's not a fence, as some American newspapers call it. It's a huge wall. It's three times as long and twice as high as Berlin Wall used to be. And when, even when it looks like a fence, it's 150 meters width. This wall has taken away big parts of the territories, separated Palestinians from each other. And uh, this is an example. This is a lady standing on the roof of her two-floor building in Bethlehem. Her house is surrounded by the wall from three directions. And later, she was told she cannot go to the roof of her own house. And when she asked the military why, they told her that she would represent a threat to the wall. This is another example. The wall, as you can see, in 85% of the time, is not separating Palestinians from Israelis. Actually, it is separating Palestinians from Palestinians. And it is inside Palestinian territories. And in some places like Kalkilia, a city with almost 50,000 people, the wall is besieging the city completely. The city is totally surrounded by this huge wall, leaving only one little road, which is eight meters width, with a gate. And the Israeli army can shut off the gate anytime they want. And this is how it looks if you look at it from air. And, of course, so many people who are prohibited from crossing, uh, can you click it, please, cannot get in or out unless they have a military permit. I'm talking about people in need to go to schools, to universities, patients who need to go to hospitals or clinics, because they live in isolated communities and they have these military checkpoints. But if they have a military permit, they would not be allowed to cross unless they respect that schedule which the army has put there. They can cross only from 7.40 to 8 in the morning, from 2 to 2.15 p.m., and from 6.45 to 7 p.m. That's why no less than 87 Palestinian women had to give birth in front of checkpoints or these gates, and one-third of them lost their babies. That's why when women are pregnant in these communities, they make sure that when they are six or seven months pregnant, they would leave their community and go to live with friends or relatives in another place 
so that when labor comes, and you know it doesn't come on schedule, they can go to the hospital. But that does not prevent the fact that we have lost many people who had heart attacks and the checkpoint was closed and they couldn't get, um, uh, get, get through. This is how it looks when children need to go to school. And this is one of our medical teams prevented from crossing to give treatment to these people. If we need to send our mobile clinics to these communities, we need military permits for each individual, for each doctor, for each nurse, for each health worker. This used to be a farm in the upper part of the picture. And in the lower part, you can see what the Israeli army did. They bulldozed it completely when they, they built the wall. This was a market in a village called Nazlet Isa. This, was, this is what happened to it when the wall was built. And this is one of the houses that were cut into two pieces to build the wall. And this is an example of a settlement. And this is an example of a village near that settlement. There are two processes happening in Palestine today. One process is the settlement building, the oppression, the persecution of Palestinians. And another process is the popular Palestinian resistance to that injustice, which is something I'm very proud of. It's a Palestinian resistance that insists that we get our rights. It is mostly nonviolent resistance. It's something we've been advocating for the last 15 years. And it goes on. This is an example of one demonstration. And in that demonstration, you can see that young man standing near me, who is a Jewish person. He's an Israeli. His name is Jonathan. Some Israelis, although they are not many, join our demonstrations. And they also are subjected to the same oppression we are subjected to. And you can see there, there, was a, there is a Palestinian flag and even an Israeli flag together against these Israeli soldiers. These demonstrations happen everywhere. And this is an example in one of the villages, Bil'in, where they demonstrate for more than 12 years now, every Friday, demanding the return of their land that was confiscated. This is a fantastic other example of our demonstration in Bejala, where you can see religious leaders also participate against the land confiscation. And this is another example of a demonstration in Hebron with 80,000 people. Why were they demonstrating then? They were demonstrating, demanding that the Israeli army return the bodies of their children who were killed by the army and which are withheld by the Israeli authorities. You know, Israel does not only imprison 7,000 Palestinian prisoners today, but they also imprison no less than 100 bodies of Palestinians killed. This is another one in Ramallah. This is, and this is an example of something fantastic that happened recently in July, when Israel tried to change the norms in Haram Sharif and put cameras and checkpoints, and, and con they wanted to control the entrance, and practically they wanted to change the whole situation of the right of the Palestinians to, to pray freely. And there was something that the Israelis never expected. There was a true, popular, nonviolent uprising against this action. What started with tens of people became demonstrations of hundreds, and then thousands, and then tens of thousands. And eventually, this fascinating story of people resisting through prayer. All they did was to pray. And the army was trying to prevent them from praying in these areas around the mosque. So prayer has become a fascinating form of resistance. And the most beautiful thing that I saw there in Jerusalem, I was there, and I saw many Christian Palestinians 
holding the Bible and joining the prayer, the Muslim prayer. We were praying together. And it was a fascinating story that spread all over the world and practically exposed what the Israeli army was doing. Look how many soldiers are trying to suppress this lady who, who just wanted to get to the prayer site. So eventually, this form of nonviolence resistance worked, and we forced Netanyahu to retreat. What states and governments failed to achieve was achieved by ordinary people through fascinating grassroots nonviolent resistance on the ground. So today, in a way, I would like to say that the life of the Palestinians is a life of resistance in every form. But we are encountered with severe violence. What, what, what hurts me a lot is that when Palestinians demonstrate peacefully and nonviolently and in massive amounts, it rarely gets reported in the world media. But when there is a little act of violence somewhere, it becomes the story. What hurts us a lot also is that the forms of violence that the Israeli army is using against the Palestinian nonviolent resistance is rarely reported. For instance, they use tear gas. Of course, tear gas is used against demonstrators everywhere. But in our case, they have these machines that can throw up to 50 canisters in one minute, creating what we call in medicine a closed room effect, which leads to suffocation. And we have people who died because of suffocation from tear gas. In addition to tear gas, they, 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 they can use other forms. This is an example. These are, what you can see here, are examples of what, the, of what weapons they use. They have stun grenades, which can be very dangerous if they hit the head or the eye. They have what they call rubber bullets, but these are not rubber bullets. These are metallic bullets covered with a thin piece of rubber, as you can see in the picture. And they use also high-velocity bullets. I'll tell you a personal story. In 1996, there, was, there were demonstrations against the Israeli plans to build tunnels under the Haram al-Sharif. And the Israeli army attacked these demonstrations and shot people. I was called to help a young man who was bleeding and who was put in a room on the fifth floor in a building. I was wearing my white coat and I went to help him. I tried to stop the bleeding. And while I was stopping, trying to stop the bleeding, an Israeli sniper from a near building saw me and shot me twice with these high-velocity high bullets. I still carry in my shoulders 37 shrapnels of these bullets. So if, if, if soldiers can shoot a doctor in a white coat while he is trying to assist a person who is injured, what, what is the thing that they cannot do? This is just an example of the suffering that people are subjected to, and that rarely gets recognized, unfortunately. This is an example of the results of what they call rubber bullets. You hear rubber bullet and you think it's nothing. But as I said, these are metallic bullets. This young man was not luck as lucky as I am. He died because these bullets cut his spinal cord. The next one, is another example of another young man who died because the bullet entered the brain, creating what we call the nightmare of the surgeon, of the neurosurgeon. Because if you leave the bullet, each time they move their head, it moves, destroying more tissues. And if you try to remove it, you can cause a lot of brain damage. Many people, especially young people, have lost their eyes because of this of the Israeli attacks. During the last, during the two weeks of that small uprising in Jerusalem, we had five people killed by high velocity bullets and 1,500 people injured, including many who have lost their eyes. And this is another example 
of what the Israeli army does. And I'm showing you that, I know some of you might have seen it, but I'm showing you that because the media in Britain does not show you that. This is an example of a young man who was just peacefully demonstrating, carrying a flag. He was arrested, he was blindfolded, he was handcuffed, he was forced on the ground for two and a half hours. And while he was blindfolded and handcuffed, an Israeli officer ordered a soldier to shoot him from the distance of one and a half meters. You can move on. They even use dogs against demonstrators. As you can see here, this happened not long time ago in a village called Kufr Qaddum in the north. Next, please. Even when we have young people trying just to cycle on the segregated roads, you can see how they treat us, and you can see how they, what they did to a Danish young man who just came in solidarity with us. Next, please. So there is a lot of oppression, but there is a lot of resistance. And it affects everybody. People try to break the wall. People try to remove military checkpoints. That's, go back, please. This is an example of what we did in Beit Jala, near Bethlehem. They put a, a checkpoint that prevents people from reaching their land and that prohibits freedom of movement. And uh, we demonstrated for two years, no effect. So one day we decided just to go there and remove it with our own hands. Please, no, you can click it back, please, and just click on it. Thank you. The army came back afterwards. And they were angry, but they couldn't find us. So they brought another checkpoint. But you know, it was a bit shorter. <laughs> so in a way, the road remained open. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that the daily life of Palestinians is resistance. Going to work is resistance. Praying is resistance. Getting treatment is resistance. In Christmas time, 
our guys dressed as Santa Claus and go and also demonstrate. In Easter time, all the time, they climb the walls, they cross the walls, they have specialists now in developing ladders that can, through which you can climb, and people get to pray when they have to go, and we demonstrate demanding boycott of Israeli products, and I encourage you to do that. Boycott, divestment, sanctions, yes, it's not a bad word, it's a very good word, it's an effective word, it's a, an effective way that has helped the people of South Africa become free from that system of oppression, and it's not against Jewish people. It's not against Jewish people, it's against injustice, against colonialism, and against the system of apartheid. This has to be clear, and it has to be clear also that we have to continue the struggle in every possible way. Next, please. Sport is another form of resistance. This is, by the way, the Palestinian team in a club called Palestino in Chile. They have a very good team. They win many games, and they decided to use, instead of the number, the map of Palestine, for which there was a big uproar, of course, in Chile about it. Next, please. So what I'm trying to tell you is that Every aspect of life is becoming an act of resistance. Art is becoming a beautiful way of resisting occupation. And it is used in so many ways and in so many places. Next, please. Uh, next, please. The people are determined to get freedom. Next. Planting trees is a form of resistance. Building what we call Resistance villages, where we go and try to build in the area where they try to prohibit us, is another form of resistance. The strike in prisons is another form of resistance, because these people in prisons have nothing in their hands but to go on hunger strike and demand their rights. And they are doing a fantastic, noble thing. These are demonstrations in front of one of the Israeli prisons in the occupied territories. Going to Gaza on ships violating the Israeli rules was another form of resistance which we also conducted. And it was great for a moment before they destroyed the ship. And this is the picture of the young boy from the family in Nablus who was burned by settlers. He lost his mother, his brother, his father, but he remained resilient. What I'm trying to say is that just I'm showing you the last image here. I don't know, have you seen this image before? How many of you have seen it before? That's encouraging. Most of the visitors who come to see us never saw this image. It's the young boy, Faris Oudi, who stood up to a tank with a little stone. If I ask people, did you see this image, frequently they say no. But many people, I ask them whether they have seen the image of that young man in Tiananmen Square. And they always say, yes, we did. And that shows you how skewed the media is in this world. And that's why I have, I have a duty to come here and tell you the story. And we have a duty to spread the information and the knowledge to everybody. As Daniel Berenboim told me once, this great musician who's a friend of us, and a supporter, by the way, also of BDS, he said, knowledge is the beginning. If you start with knowing the truth, you can change the reality. Faris Ode, that young man at Tiananmen Square, I don't know whether he died or not, I think he didn't, but Faris Ode was crushed by that tank. And so was Rachel Corey. Next, please. Rachel Corey, who was killed also by an Israeli bulldozer. I will finish here by saying, don't listen to those who say that solidarity with Palestine is anti-Semitic. Don't believe those who are trying to divert you and try to claim that when we tell the truth, we are practicing incitement. And don't believe them when they claim that Palestinians struggle for freedom is an act of terror. Don't accept that partition of people 
that some Zionist people are doing, where the world is divided into first category, those who are completely loyal to Israel and fully supportive of its policies. These are the good guys. And then you have those who struggle against the occupation, like myself, and we are called terrorists. And then you have those who support Palestinian struggle and are in solidarity with it, and they call them anti-Semites. And then you have very good Jewish people who are supporting the justice, and they call them self-hating Jews. These, part these divisions are unacceptable. And my final word is that we are there. We're not going to leave. We learned from what happened in 48. Maybe Israel has succeeded in many things, but it has failed to force us out. We are there. We're going to stay there. We're going to get our freedom, and we're going to get justice. And when that happens, it would be a good day, not only for Palestinians, but also for Jewish people as well. When that day happens, we will fulfill the wish of Nelson Mandela, who said on the day when South Africa was liberated that the, our freedom in South Africa is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. He also said the Palestinian issue is the greatest moral issue of our time. Thank you so much.